Good evening. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the presentation of the 19th Annual Gruber Genetics Prize, honoring a leading scientist or scientific group for groundbreaking contributions to any realm of genetics research. And this year, it happens to be human genetics research. We are pleased to host the Gruber Foundation. I would, I would amend that. We're thrilled to host the Gruber Foundation. And I invite their executive director, Sarah Rea, to say a few words about the foundation and the prize. Sarah? Thank you, Dr. Biesecker. We are delighted to be here in Houston to present the prize at the ASHG's 69th annual meeting. While we are here to honor Bert Vogelstein, let me mention that he joins Cosmology Prize recipients Nicholas Kaiser and Joseph Silk, and Neuroscience Prize recipient Joseph Takahashi on our 2019 roster. Please note that nominations to the 2020 Gruber Prizes are open until December 15, 2019, and that we encourage nominations that reflect the breadth of the fields and the diversity of those working within them. Before we return to genetics, I simply must acknowledge our co-founders, Peter and Patricia Gruber, whose combined vision and leadership established the International Prize Program, and whose care in doing so by affiliating with organizations such as the Genetic Society of America and ASHG, gave it the legs to stand on its own. Let me invite Hugo Bellin to say just a few words about the Gruber collaboration with GSA. So, <clears throat> the Genetic Society of America is pleased to collaborate with the Gruber Foundation on this genetics prize. And it, the GSA is also proud to work on another award called the Rosalind Franklin Young Investigator Award, which is presented in honor of the groundbreaking contribution of Rosalind Franklin, the X-ray crystallographer, and to inspire and support new generations of women in the field of genetics. GSA administers this exciting fellowship in the Gruber Award with the Gruber Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bellin. We look forward to presenting two new Rosalind Franklin Fellows at the 2020 Prize at GSA's uh, Allied Genetics Conference. Our relationship with GSA is invaluable. Bert Vogelstein joins an illustrious laureate list. He was chosen by a distinguished selection advisory board nominated by GSA. We sincerely appreciate the knowledge, commitment, and enthusiasm that these advisors bring to the selection process. Let me now invite the chair of this board, Helen Hobbs, to present the official citation and introduce the scientific accomplishments of our recipient. Dr. Hobbs. Uh, this is the official citation for the prize, and I'm going to read it to you. The Gruber Foundation proudly presents the 2019 Genetics Prize to Bert Vogelstein for his discoveries of new genetic pathways and processes contributing to cancer. He showed that malignant transformation of colorectal cancers results from the stepwise acquisition of mutations in oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, thus elucidating the somatic evolution of cancer. Using cutting edge technologies and approaches, he identified new genetic defects that alter cell signaling, promote cell growth, and compromise the integrity of DNA repair. His work has advanced our understanding of cancer pathogenesis and led to the development of new diagnostic tests and targeted therapies for cancer. When Todd Gullup nominated Dr. Vogelstein for this award, he aptly stated, if one were to single out one individual for our current understanding of the cancer genome, it would be Bert Vogelstein. It is impossible to adequately summarize in the next few minutes the many contributions of Dr. Vogelstein and his scientific partner 
Dr. Kenneth Kinsler to our understanding of cancer. I have time to just mention a few things. In the 1980s, it was known that cancer, cancers had a plethora of mutations. The prevailing view at the time was that the mutations in cancer were a consequence of the malignancy. Vogelstein showed that some of the mutations actually were the cause of the malignancy, that tumors arise through an orderly, stepwise acquisition of mutations, a process that has affectionately been referred to as the Vogel-Gram. He showed that somatic mutations in P53 were common in cancer, that the protein binds DNA, and that it acts as a tumor suppressor gene. He was a leader discovering the molecular basis of familial forms of colorectal cancer, finding that APC is mutated in familial polyposis, and with Atonin and De La Chapelle, that mutations in genes in the mismatch repair pathway cause hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, as well, as you know, as a, a, uh, in some sporadic cancers. He and Ken Kinsler, his scientific partner, were the most cited biomedical scientists in the world in the 1990s. I would like to share with you three very distinctive features of Dr. Vogelstein's work. First, from the very beginning, he focused his attention on human tissue. Of course, this is customary now, but at the time he started, most everyone working in cancer thought you could not understand mechanism without working with viruses or in model organisms. Second, he has a track record of being technically bold. He recognized that to understand cancer, he needed to characterize entire transcriptomes and genomes of tumors in an unbiased fashion. To do this posed significant technical challenges, but these never stopped him. As an example, when he wanted to interrogate the transcriptome of tumors in a comprehensive digital manner, he did not wait for RNA-seq like the rest of us. He and Kinsler developed an entirely new method, serial analysis of gene expression, better known as SAGE, that allowed for quantitative and simultaneous analysis of tissue transcripts. Yes, patience, patience is not this man's virtue. He did not wait for next generation sequencing to characterize exomes in, of tumors. He pushed the sequencing technology available at that time, which was Sanger sequencing, to its very limits, and sequenced the coding regions of over 13,000 genes in selected cancers, an experiment requiring over 450,000 primers, and experiments all performed in his laboratory. And in the process, he identified cancer-causing mutations, some in seemingly boring housekeeping genes like isocitrate dehydrogenase 1, turning them into new therapeutic targets. His brute force approach to the sequencing of tumor exomes inspired the establishment of the Cancer Ec Genome Atlas. Finally, and lastly, he's never lost sight of the ultimate objective, to cure cancer by first diagnosing it, the earlier, the better. And he has developed new methods to do just that. I want to end by quoting Eric Lander, who commented that no person has had a greater impact on our understanding of cancer as a genetic disease than Bert Vogelstein. On behalf of the Gruber Foundation and the Gruber Genetics Prize Selection Committee, it is an honor and indeed a pleasure to present Dr. Vogelstein with this very special award. Bert Vogelstein, please come forward and receive the prize.
More stuff. <laughs> there you go. Great. Do you, do you want to hold that up just a little higher? Oh, the do we not? There you go. <laughs> Oh, now she can see Great, excellent. Big smile. This, you got that, you got your pen, you got, got it all. I got everything. They got all my stuff. <laughs> so thank you, Helen, for a very kind and generous introduction. And thank you, of course, to the Grubers for this incredible honor. It really is a tribute, not only to me, but to the many individuals that I've had the pleasure of working with, our collaborators, and especially our trainees. Over the last 40 years, I've had the privilege of mentoring 161 young scientists, mentored them and learned from them, and they have been responsible not only for doing the bulk of the work, that this award honors, but also for coming up with many of the seminal ideas that Helen alluded to. This is a picture taken a few years ago of our larger collaborative group at Hopkins. I just want to acknowledge the man in the front is Ken Kinsler, who Helen mentioned, who's been my research partner for many years and who's been responsible for many of the most innovative and productive types of research that have been done in our lab. And what is that research? That will be the subject of this lecture. Hmm. Ah. I will call the lecture Cancer Genes and Their Implications for Patients. And I will discuss three related areas. First, cancer gene quantification, how many cancer genes there are and their basic nature. Second, how we exploit them for therapeutics. And third, how they can be exploited for diagnostic. And let's start with quantification. There have been literally thousands of studies on cancer genomes over the last 10 years. The amount of information that has been accumulated is truly daunting, even to people who have spent their life studying cancer genes, but can be even more daunting to those who are not immersed in this field. And I'd like to try to take the essence of this information and distill it in the next few slides so we're all on the same page. Here I've represented each chromosome as a piano key. And each of those tires signifies a mutation that's present in a typical solid tumor, in this case, a pancreatic cancer called PA34. You can see that there are about 50 mutations, that is 50 tires distributed throughout the genome. These are only the coding mutations, only the non-synonymous mutations that change an amino acid. This looks pretty complex. But if you just look at the driver genes, those genes which are actually causally involved in the process, the picture is much simpler. There are only three of them, two tumor suppressor genes and one oncogene. The oncogene, the familiar KRAS, and the tumor suppressor genes, the familiar TP53, and a commonly mutated tumor suppressor gene called SMAD4. These are the proximate causes of cancers in this patient. And this picture is fairly representative. It's usually about two tumor suppressor genes and one oncogene that's mutated in the majority of solid tumors. The rest of the 50 mutations are just passengers. They're just mutations that occurred as cells grow. Now, these passengers have no role in the pathogenetic process of neoplasia, but as you'll see in a few minutes, they can be exploited for the therapy of cancer. 
Now, how many driver genes are there in total? This number comes from a recent paper from Jiang et al., and I think is the most accurate and careful annotation of them. There are only 121. That's in all cancer types, all 26 cancer types that were analyzed, which account for virtually all of the cancers that occur in the world. Of those, a little more than two-thirds are tumor suppressor genes, and a third are oncogenes. This represents less than 1% of the total genes, and if we really understood how these 121 driver genes worked, we would be able to develop new therapeutics. These are the keys to cancer. Now, even without precise knowledge of how they work, things can be done. And part of the reason things can be done is because tumors are a gradual evolutionary process. It takes three mutations, on average, I'm obviously simplifying a bit, but on average about three mutations to take a normal cell to a fully malignant cell. The first mutation, let's call it strike one, initiates the tumor. It begins the process. It results in a microscopically sized tumor, but a tumor nonetheless. A second mutation, long afterwards, in one of the progeny of the cells that had acquired the first mutation, leads to expansion to a still benign tumor, but one large enough that one might be able to see it with the naked eye. And then the third mutation, the most critical one clinically, converts that cell which had already contained two driver gene mutations into an invasive cancer. That is a cell that it can invade through the basement membrane, membrane and metastasize to other tissues. This is what distinguishes a malignant tumor, aka cancer, from a benign tumor, its ability to invade. Now, this process is not quick. It takes 20 to 30 years, and that's good news because it means there's lots of room, lots of time to intervene in the process if possible. And I'll get back to that subject later in this lecture. I don't know how I, to get back a slide, but who's ever working it, go back one, please. Okay, whoops, too much. Go back one more. What causes these driver gene mutations? Now, historically, there were two causes. One is environment, and the other one is heredity. And the contribution of cancer to, um, from environment or heredity is well known. Heredity causes, of course, predispositions to cancer, like for breast cancer with the BRCA genes or mismatch repair genes in colorectal cancer, and environmental causes such as cigarette smoke and ultraviolet light have been known for decades. And their precise role in cancer in terms of how much they increase the risk has been well known. What hasn't really been appreciated is the third factor that actually is responsible for most of the mutations that occur. And the reason that that wasn't as well known is because it's so hard to quantify the contribution of this third factor. And recently, the work of Christian Tomasetti, who's a mathematician um, at Hopkins, has clarified the role of these R mutations. Now, let me explain what they are in epidemiologic terms. This is not the experiment that Christian did, but pretend it is as a thought experiment for a second. Suppose he looked at the concentrations of a compound, let's call it compound R, in all of the tissues, all of the normal tissues in bodies. And suppose he found that in normal bone, the concentration of R was 10,000 times less than the concentration in normal colon. And suppose then he found 
that the incidence of colorectal cancers in this population was 10,000 times the incidence of bone cancers in this same population. He might find that there is a very high correlation between the compound concentration of R and the incidence of cancer. And suppose then he found that compound R was a potent mutagen, a very potent one. Then I think the logical conclusion of these observations would be that compound R likely contributes to the variation in cancer risk among tissues. And that's what he concluded, but compound R is just cell division. You all know, as geneticists, that cell division is itself a potent mutagen. Every time a cell divides, every time a normal human cell divides, five new mutations throughout the genome occur. And Christian, in the subsequent study, showed that this was true throughout the world, looking at registries that included 4.8 billion people, as would be expected if this is just a basic part of human life, evolution. Cancer is, in one sense, a side effect of evolution. Mutations occur in normal cells as they divide. Christian also concluded, through studies which I won't go through, that in more than half of cancer types, all three mutations are likely due to R, that is, replicative mutations that occur during normal cell division in the absence of any exogenous influence. And the reason that this is important is when we think about how to reduce cancer deaths in the future, we have to recognize what's going to happen. First of all, the population, our population is aging, which is good. But second, even if we completely cleaned up our planet, and even if we all exercise three times a day, and even if we all ate kale shakes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we would still have cancers, lots of them, because our cells divide. So the task now is how do we use this genetic information, the knowledge now of the actual genes that are involved and the importance of mutations in cancer to actually help people. And this takes us to the second part of the lecture, which is some examples of how we can exploit this information. And I'll tell you a story. Um, a, that started with Suzanne Tapalian, who's a surgical oncologist at Hopkins, who published a landmark paper in 2012 in the New England Journal showing that immune checkpoint inhibitor, something that turned on the immune response to cancers, had remarkable effects in patients, patients with melanomas and with lung cancers but not in patients with other types of tumors, such as colon cancers or pancreatic cancers or most other solid tumors. And that obviously brought up a question. What is different about melanomas and lung cancers? And Drew works closely with an immunologist named Drew Pardol. I should, in fact, say they work intimately together. They're married. And Drew was my, actually, my first graduate student back in the 80s. So he and Suzanne came up to our lab and asked us if perhaps there were any genetic insights we could provide about why this relationship was found, why this form of therapy works so well in melanomas and lung cancers, but not so well in other tumor types. And once they showed us these data, just prior to its publication, it, it became kind of obvious that there was a difference, at least from a genetic viewpoint. Here on the x-axis is a bunch of common tumors, and on the y-axis is the number of mutations per tumor. If you look at most tumors, you'll see that the average is around 50 non-synonymous mutations 
per genome per tumor, just like in the first pancreatic cancer I showed you. But there are a couple tumor types that stand out. One is lung cancer and one is melanoma. And the reasons for that are obvious. There are lots of more mutations in melanomas because of the exposure to ultraviolet light, and there are lots more mutations in lung cancers because of the exposure to the carcinogens and mutagens in cigarette smoke. So this seemed to offer an explanation for Suzanne's findings. The more mutations there were, the more likely that some of them would be recognized as foreign by the patient's own immune system. And then if the immune system were revved up appropriately, perhaps it could control them through an immune checkpoint inhibitor. But there was one more thing we pointed out to Suzanne and Drew, and that is there was a third tumor type, tumors with mismatch repair deficiency. These are the genes responsible for the so-called Lynch syndrome, or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, that Helen mentioned in her introduction. And these tumors have thousands of mutations per genome, considerably more than either lung cancers or melanomas. So we thought, hey, these tumors, if this hypothesis is correct, should be incredibly sensitive to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we were very excited about this idea and immediately sent this idea, this proposal, off for publication and were uh, immediately rejected um, as too conjectural. And in fact, we had problems convincing pharmaceutical companies to sponsor a trial to test this idea. The idea seems quite reasonable now, but back then, there wasn't a clear correlation or connection between cancer genetics and immunology. At any rate, we thought the hypothesis was likely to be true. Everybody in this audience knows genetics don't lie. They tell you the truth. And we actually, in our lab, sponsored the trial. It wasn't sponsored by a drug company. Merck was generous enough to give us the drug, an antibody and immune checkpoint inhibitor, but the study was actually sponsored by Johns Hopkins. And this study was run by Zhang Li and Luis Diaz, two oncologists, and it was published a couple of years ago. And the results were really quite remarkable, as I think most of you know. The majority of patients with mismatch repair deficient tumors responded to the immune checkpoint inhibitor, now called Keytruda, as you can see from this waterfall plot. And it worked on all tumor types, independent of tumor type. This led, a couple of years ago, to the first approval by FDA of what they called a tumor agnostic drug. All previous approvals had been for a specific cancer type, like a drug for breast cancer or colon cancer. This drug was approved for any cancer type as long as the cancer had a mismatch repair gene deficiency. It's kind of an epitome or a realization of precision medicine is that we're now going from the tumor type to its actual underlying genetics, the basis, the pathogenetic basis and cause of the tumors. And this paradigm has now been reproduced with a couple of other drugs which have similarly been approved for just genome-based mutations, nothing else, independent of tumor type. Now, I want to mention that this form of therapy and virtually, in fact, all other new cancer therapies are not generally curative. They put patients into remissions, sometimes long ones, and this red arrow shows that in this study, the drug induced 100%, that is, complete regressions of tumors for some periods of times in these patients, but the patients generally aren't cured. Some of them are, fortunately, but most are not. And that's true in general for the new generation of targeted drugs. 
One prominent example, prominent example, is a drug that targets a mutant BRAF in melanomas. This is a patient before therapy. This is a patient after four months of therapy with this drug that attacks the BRAF mutation. It's miraculous. All of the tumors have disappeared, every single one of them gone. Unfortunately, nearly as miraculously, they all returned a few months later. And if you look carefully, you can see they all returned at the same spot. These are not new tumors. These are regrowth of the original tumors. Now, how could that be? And how could they all recur so temporarily close in time? This question was answered by Martin Nowak's group. Martin is an evolutionary biologist at Harvard. And the bottom line is that drug resistance occurs because there are hundreds to thousands of resistant cells present in every clinically evident metastatic lesion prior to therapy, before any therapy is started. And once therapy is started, it's just a ticking time bomb, in a sense, till those cells which are resistant to the therapy grow back and cause a regression or, or overcome the regression um, to cause uh, a new growth of tumors at the same spot. And this brings up another question. It's hard to cure humans, but we can cure mice. In fact, I personally have cured many mice. Um, if you are a mouse, I would advise you to come to my lab. <laughs> I can offer you hope, especially if I have injected you with that tumor a couple weeks before. But why is it? Well, I think one of the simplest region, reasons is often overlooked. This is a CT scan of a patient on a typical phase three trial who has lots of metastases in the liver indicated by each of those red arrows. That's a mouse. The tumor is much bigger, much, much bigger than the whole mouse. And this is a fairly large tumor in a mouse. You can barely see it by comparison. It's really just a simple numbers game. The chance of cure is inversely proportional to the number of cells in the tumor. And human tumors have thousands of times more cells than mouse tumors. They're much, much larger in three dimensions. And the probability that at least one of those cells in the tumor is already resistant to whatever drug you throw at it is astronomically higher than what it is in a mouse. And that's one of the main reasons mouse tumors are easy to cure. Now, how do we exploit this information? Well, how to cure cancer. Turn people into mice. Now, I'd like you not to tweet that slide. I don't want to see it in the newspaper tomorrow that the Gruber Prize Award winner says the way to beat cancer is to turn people into mice. I don't think the committee would appreciate that. But I'm only being partly tongue in cheek, as you'll see at the end of the lecture when I say this. Which brings us to diagnostics. Now, there has been this age-old dilemma about what to do in all fields of research. What's better, cure versus prevention? In cancer, the focus has been on curing advanced cancers. But I actually come from a background in pediatrics. And in pediatrics, the major advances in public health have come from prevention rather than cure. That doesn't mean cures are not important. Of course they are. But if you look from a global perspective, 
a 30,000 foot view, the advances made through prevention, that is better public health as well as vaccine, is the predominant cause of the huge reduction in childhood deaths over the last century. And this audience, I'm sure, is aware of the same principle. In genetic diseases, hereditary diseases, yes, some may be cured eventually, but prevention is always better than cure. And a good examples of that are, of course, provided by trisomy 21 and cystic fibrosis, diseases which still can't be cured, but they can be prevented. So when the genetic analyses, the genetic compositions, uh, landscapes of tumors started to become clear, our group started to think about how we might use this information not just to cure cancers, but to prevent them. And our first paper on this subject was published in 1992 when David Sidransky, then in our lab, showed that RAS oncogene mutations could be detected in the stool of colorectal cancer patients as an indicator that there really was a cancer there. And many years later, more than 20 years later, this discovery was turned into a di excuse me, diagnostic assay. A company called Exact started to sell a product called Coligard, which represented the first FDA approval for genetic-based non-invasive DNA screening tests for cancer. And now there are millions of patients every year taking advantage of this non-invasive test as an alternative to colonoscopy. More recently, our lab's attention has been focused on liquid biopsies, which means blood tests rather than stool tests for detecting cancers of many different sites. And the advantages of blood as an analyte are obvious. Most, can all cancers are exposed to the blood and they should secrete mutant DNA into the circulation, which could be detectable if power powerful enough technologies are developed. And the last uh, study from our group uh, on this subject was led by Josh Cohn, who's an incredibly talented graduate student. And I'll just briefly summarize those results. There were 800, um, uh, actually, I'll give an update from that paper, which was published in Science last year. There are now 812 healthy controls, which Josh has studied, and a similar number of cancers, which are early, in the sense that none of them were metastatic at the time of diagnosis. And these accounted for the majority of cancer deaths in the United States, the seven cancers that were chosen for this study. And these are the results at a very high specificity. Those of you who are used to thinking about diagnostics know that specificity has to be extremely high to form a useful test or there will be too many false positives, especially for a screening test. So at a very high specificity, which means there are four false positives out of about 800 healthy adults, these seven cancer types, for which there's no screening test available for most, were detected at sensitivities roughly 70 to 90 percent. Not perfect, but certainly better than zero percent, which is the status now. All cancers that are detected now, and many of these are organs, are simply detected when patients have symptoms, which is way too late. Now, this was a retrospective study. In a prospective study, in which healthy adults are engaged, one expects less sensitivity because the tumors are less advanced. And we haven't completed that trial of this test called Cancer Seek Yet, but we've completed enrollment of 10,000 healthy individuals, actually all healthy women, between 65 and 75 years of age at the Geisinger Health System, 
and hope to publish those results within the next six months. What I can say is that I look at the future of cancer care to involve not just new therapeutics or new diagnostics, but the combination of both. And let me show you why I hold such high hope for this juxtaposition. These, this graph represents patients with colorectal cancer who had micrometastases, that is metastatic lesions too small to see on CT scans when they were treated with adjuvant therapy, standard chemotherapy, nothing special, nothing targeted. 47%, that is close to half of those patients, were cured in a retrospective analysis. If one waits until those same patients have bulky disease that can be detected by a CT scan, then the same therapy cures no one, 0%. And this is, of course, quite consonant with the concept of Martin Nowak and colleagues that tumor burden is critical for determining whether tumors will recur or not. The fewer tumor cells, the better. And this is not only for conventional chemotherapy. The same is true for the most advanced and promising forms of new therapy, such as immune checkpoint inhibitors. Those patients with low tumor burden can often undergo complete remissions and often undergo long-term remissions, whereas those with higher tumor burdens much do so much less often, and the same is even true with CAR T cells. This is a general principle which will impact the success of all new therapies because it's fundamental to the nature of cancer and the nature of cancer genetics. So I'll go back to this slide. Why can we cure mice? In part, it's because mouse tumors are smaller and earlier detection can actually make human tumors more like those of mice. They can be detected earlier. They don't necessarily have to be detected at a stage when they can be removed surgically. They just have to be detected at a stage when whatever new therapies are available will be more likely to work. And my hope for the future, based on the history of medicine, once the disease is understood, it's only a matter of time before that disease is conquered, at least in part. And I think the same will be true of cancer. But it will require a combination of better methods to detect cancer early, as well as new therapeutics to achieve that goal. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the companies that we work with for trying to make products out of these diagnostic assays that our group has developed. I'd finally like to thank the Gruber Foundation and the committee for giving me this wonderful award and thank you for your attention.